Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> Can't you wait to get old and be like me? So <laughs> as we're singing, that's a, just a really ex- special song, but it brought me to Psalm 5.3. It said, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. One version says that I wait in expectation. 1996, I'll never forget pastor's prayer conference in Atlanta. 60,000 pastors or elders, missionaries gathered in the uh, dome down there. And Tony Evans' opening message was the same old, same old. He was talking to pastors. Get up, struggle all week, trying to fight life, try to put a sermon together, get up with the sense that it doesn't really matter anybody because who cares, who listens, and it's just the same old, same old. My prayer is that God would break that spirit in me and perhaps in you, that you would every day seek God with expectation, that he's a God who is relational and cares and wants to minister to us so he can minister through us. So Psalm 5.3, pray with expectation. I'm going to ask the lights to go down for a minute. Some of you are not going to have a clue who this person is. Some of you will. I'll tell you who to Google if you don't later. with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hayo Silver, the Lone Ranger. Hayo Silver, away! With his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early West. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. The Lone Ranger rides again. The Lone Ranger. How many know who he is? Clayton Moore from Detroit, Michigan, played the Lone Ranger with his faithful partner, whose name was Tonto, who often called the Lone Ranger Kimosabi. And what's cool for me is Tonto's real name is Jay Silverheels, and his nephew was my college roommate. So I was up close and up front with Tonto of the Lone Rangers. But the Lone Ranger, he wore a mask before any government mandates. And he never took it off. It was always on. The Lone Ranger and Tonto, they fought for law law and order in the West. Many people, even then, like now, have been burdened with problems. Some ones, sometimes they feel almost impossible to solve. We want to remember that since the Garden of Eden, that's always been the case. There's nothing new under the sun today. It might look different, but there's going to be mosquito bites throughout life, some bigger than others. But for those people back in the early days of the West, how great it was to know that the mass marvel, along with his sidekick Tonto, would show up to right the wrong, to bring the victory, and to usher in temporal peace. Hi-ho, silver, away. And they rode into the sunset until next week, when more problems came up. As I thought about it, I thought about the conversations that the Lone Ranger and Tonto might have had along the way. Approaching a problem, leaving with a victory. It was always victorious. But it made me think about the Bible. Moses had Aaron. David had Jonathan. Paul had Barnabas. Peter had John. Jesus had his 12, but within that, he had an inner circle of three. Sonny had Cher. Ooh. (laughs) 
They needed the Lorne Reader's help, I think. In the Luke account of the Gethsemane prayer, Jesus was in such agony, God sent an angel to comfort him. And it made me think, if it's good enough for Jesus, is it good enough for you, for me? Do you push comfort away? Do you have anyone in your life that is that Tonto or Lone Ranger who knows you inside and out as you build a relationship? Who will tell you what the, you need to know and not what you want to hear? That will pray with you and encourage you when times get difficult? What have you been feeling during these last 10, 11 months. Sometimes I think we wish that the Lone Ranger would show up on his white horse, silver, and just right all wrongs, heal all wounds, and settle down all anxieties. As we begin 2021, what do we do during this challenging and somewhat isolating time? Even when the loved ones that you're isolated with if we were honest, sometimes it might become a little bit of a challenge. I've been home too long. I need a break. I want to talk about micro and macro during this next few minutes with encouragement never to lose the big picture of what this life thing is all about. So let's pray if we could. Father in heaven, we bless your name and thank you for this day. I thank you for the word of God today. And I thank you for the many examples of life, honest life, hurting life, helping life, victorious life, defeated life, that you don't spare anything because you relate to us right where we're at. You understand Jesus. You're that great high priest who also sympathizes with our weaknesses and invites us to come to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need. Holy Spirit, speak to us today, I pray, through your word. Help us, encourage us, in Jesus' name, amen. Micro and macro, don't lose the big picture. What is the micro for today? It's all about the word encouragement. Encouragement. The word encourage is an old French room, encourager meaning to make strong or to hearten. Biblically, in the King James Dictionary, under encourage, it says, to give courage to, to give or increase confidence of success, to inspire with courage, spirit or strength of mind, to embolden, to animate, to incite, to inspirit. It's not flattery. Anybody can flatter somebody, and it can be as cheap as a fake nickel. To encourage means to breathe in courage to somebody. It's what God did to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. Three times he said, be strong and courageous, for I am with you. Encouragement is for the purpose of forming Christian character and developing godly purpose in each of our lives. How many here know that you have a godly purpose from God made right for you? I hope you do. He didn't make you, and I, he loves you. I know your picture's on his refrigerator in heaven. But he didn't just make you to say, boy, what a great looking guy or gal you are. He's got a purpose for you. Minimally to glorify his name in all things, whatever we do. Do as heartily as unto the Lord, not the man. It's the Lord Christ that I serve, right? But he's given you spiritual gifts that make you maybe a little unique from somebody else on how you do what you do. All with the same purpose, but you get there in different ways. That's what makes the body of Christ exciting when it operates the right way. The other thing about encouragement is it puts fear in its proper perspective. It's not, I'm afraid. It's the fear that Pastor Mark talked about. It's reverence. It's the confidence that God is in me. 
And God can, will do through me anything he asks me to do. Thus, don't be limited by your own limitations if God is telling you to go somewhere, do something. He will provide by his grace whatever he tells you to do, but you got to accept it by faith. Encouragement is like giving. Because in a time like this, it'll force you to take your eyes off of yourself. One of the great issues of a time like this, especially when I think of anxiety, if we were honest, we would say, I'm thinking about myself and my situation almost all the time. And it's strangling. But encouragement is like giving. It takes my eyes off me, and I, as I bless somebody, it's like the old boomerang. It comes back to bless me all the time. Jesus doesn't say give because he wants to take. He wants to give back to you. If your hand is closed, nothing goes in it. But when you open up that hand, a cycle, a flow starts. As you give, it comes back. As you give, it comes back. It may not come back from the same person you gave to, but keep the back door open. Because God is faithful. But you won't know that unless you trust it by what? Faith. Some people have the spiritual gift of encouragement or, or exhortation, as it says in Romans 12, 8. The Bible says if that is you, do it generously and do it often. Don't sit on it. Don't stuff it. It's so important. It's kind of like the fuel that you put into the engine. It's that energy you need when you're dragging it's that power you get from heaven when you say, I can't. And he says, I can through you. Consider Barnabas. Barnabas in the book of Acts, his nickname was a son of encouragement. He obviously had this gift. But I had to step back and say, where would there even be a New Testament church if Barnabas wasn't faithful to minister the gift of encouragement that he did? Barnabas stood in the gap between that new believer, Saul, who persecuted Christians, killed them. And the disciples, can you imagine Saul runs over there, hey guys, I'm one of you now. Oh, I ain't believe in you. Barnabas stood in the gap as he ministered to Saul. He gave confidence to the disciples of a new testimony that was starting to form in this Christian persecutor who became the father of all apostles, Paul, who God used to probably write half of the New Testament. Where would we be today if there wasn't a Barnabas? You might say, well, that's fine, but that's not my spiritual gift. That's okay. But in the micro way of operating today, I want you to consider the role that you can serve during a time of pandemic if you creatively activate four thing, five things. A, your prayer life. B, your phone. Now, many are, have that phone active all the time. But what are you doing with it? C, your texting skills. D, your email. And yes, E, good old snail mail. These are five ways you can take the focus off yourself and go encourage somebody else. And you don't even have to be with them. Well, I can't do anything during this pandemic. Baloney. You just got to get creative and do it a little differently. And I believe in this 2021, 21st century we live in, God has given us technology, which can be a great curse, but can be a blessing if we activate it to build and encourage the kingdom of God. You see, if we take this seriously, nobody's off the hook. You see, when we go through times like this, and I've been around the block long enough and I've talked to enough people, not just here, 
but across the city, across the globe. We can look really cool on the outside, smiling, everything's fine. I would bet that most of you, if I asked you how you're doing today, you'd say, I'm just fine, whether you are or not. On the inside, though, you're going to be broken, beat up, helpless, even desperate. This is how suicides happen. And the next day you say, who? Man, I didn't have a clue. You can help that by asking God to make you an encourager to somebody else, even when you're feeling crummy. Because God might use that crummy spirit to encourage someone who's a little crummier. And you can relate to that person. And even if you can't, breathe courage into them. I'm with you. God's with you. What can I do to help you? On and on and on. That's a ministry here, folks, for everybody who names the name of Jesus. Introvert, extrovert, doesn't really matter. Maybe the pandemic introverts is your blessing. I don't like to be around people, so I don't. I'm not minimizing those who aren't here. Some, I understand. It doesn't really matter if I understand. But don't think for a minute from home or work or somewhere, you can't be a factor to bring encouragement into the life of somebody. You're sitting around saying, where is God when I need him most? I want to tell you, he's right here. He's right in the midst of this thing. Remind somebody of that. Remind yourself of that today. I think in the Psalms, often Psalm 40, 42, the psalmist David is speaking to himself. Why, oh God, am I so downcast? Why, oh heart, am I heavy? Sometimes we have to speak to ourselves, But how much better if you're doing that to somebody else and encouraging them? The role of encouragement, just to name a few. Paul and his partners oftentimes returned to churches that they had re, uh, recently planted to see how they were doing. He didn't leave them out there hanging. Romans chapter 15, verse 2 Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. Hmm. Please our neighbor, build up the neighbor. I don't see anything there about me. God will take care of me when I take care of others. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever, whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They encourage through the scriptures which brings hope. They encourage by calling on the God of encouragement. And that's what Paul and his partners did, Silas and Barnabas and Timothy. They went back to churches. How's it going here? Can we help you with this? And they're planting something fresh and anew. Some of them in very, very challenging environments. Read Thessalonians, read Ephesus. There are gods like crazy. None of them Christian. Idols all over the place. It's a tough place to start a church. It's a great place to see God work. But you need encouragement because it can get very heavy. How about the encouragement we find in Hebrews chapter 3? And this is where friendship and accountability is so very important. If you think you don't need it, you're lying to yourself. I can't say it any stronger and be loving at the same time. There are no lone rangers in this scripture. None. N-O-N, nada, if you believe Spanish better. Is that better, Rachel? Raquel? (laughs) Okay. I would say somebody said, what about me, man? All right. 
The writer of Hebrews says this, Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil and unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. You don't know anybody who's turned away from the living God? I do. And it breaks my heart. But what breaks my heart the most is those people oftentimes don't say anything to anybody. And they allow the devil to have a field day. Exhort one another or encourage one another every day. Say every day. Every day. day. As long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. God might hold me accountable for your hard heart if I had opportunities to encourage you and I chose not to. We're in this thing together, people. Every single one of us need encouragement from somebody outside of myself. Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake meeting together. Now, I know that's a challenge today. Figure it out. Get creative. We've done pull-ups in driveways. We've gone out to eat with people by going through the drive through and park next to each other in the parking lot. There are ways just to touch flesh without touching flesh. Don't get too comfortable with not being with people. This might change soon. I pray. Now, I kind of laugh at the same time. This is sinister laughing. No one knew what 2020 was going to bring, did we? We talk like, oh, 21's here now. It's going to get better. Really? Do you know that? I don't know that. Because I wasn't expecting this. God's going to have his way, folks. And the church can't quit exercising the very disciplines he calls us to do. It might have to look different, but don't quit. Don't get too comfortable staying away from fellowship because there will be a day when it opens up and you won't come back. Please don't do that. Figure out how to encourage one another. Michael Jackson once said, stop the world you save may be your own. You see, when you do this, you're saving yourself because that spiritual blood is moving. It's not stagnant. John 7, my, out of my life are full of streams of living water, not stagnant ponds of stenchy water. It's got to keep moving. Sometimes it moves with a little bit of drudge. Confess the sin if it's there. But let it flow. Encouragement helps the timid, admonishes the idle, strengthens one's heart, and ministers to the morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What's going to happen to those that have died before me and the Lord? They needed encouragement to know God was going to take care of them. He's going to raise them up first. Words of encouragement are purpose to build one up one another up, not tear one another down, Ephesians 4, 29. Encouragement isn't criticism. It's building up somebody. Then you speak the truth in love. But don't use the speak the truth in love just as your excuse to nail someone when you haven't done any of this. It's much harder for me, though there are prophets in my life that'll nail me when I least expect it. But it's much easier for me to receive a word of correction from somebody who I know loves me. And they're doing it for my benefit, not for their own sense of power or whatever. Names will hurt. Whoever said sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me is the biggest liar there is. That's why you speak words of encouragement. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's a great chapter that Paul wrote, but the last verse, or verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. There's the assumption here, keep doing what you're doing. Here, it might be an assumption, it might be a challenge. Start doing. 
keep doing. And remember, the blessing falls back on you. William Arthur Ward was quoted as saying this, Flatter me not, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. Encourage me and I will never forget you. My dad confessed to me six months before he died. He didn't know what that word meant. And I, we paid for that. But I came to realize he only gave me what he knew. And all of a sudden I had a sorrowful heart for my father. Praise God he accepted Christ the night before he died. But he didn't understand encouragement. As I wrote this sermon on Thursday, I got an email from my pastor friend in Rwanda, Phineas, to encourage me for the new year. All the way from Rwanda. The micro hope to help one another, beloved. We all need it. But what do you do when you feel like you need the Lone Ranger and Tano to show up? I want to quickly give you a little macro reminders. Wednesday morning, I, I, I'm studying, and uh, I'll tell you what, I got the chills like I haven't gotten in a long time, and it wasn't COVID. I was reading John chapter 14. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And I got all teared up. I've preached this message probably 50 funerals. I preached it with passion, with compassion. And it never hit me like it did on Wednesday. And I read it over, and I tried to picture it in my mind. Do I believe this? Of course I believe it. But Lord, I'm overwhelmed by this picture. I need to embrace you, and I need to embrace your word. What does it look like you're coming down to get me? And you're going to take me to be with you forever. And I'm preparing a room in this marvelous mansion for you. Why? Because of what you did for me, not what I did for you. He is our ultimate encouragement and encourager by his word, by his work, and by God the Holy Spirit. I want to quickly remind you of one more great white horse, more powerful than Lone Ranger's brilliant horse, Silver, and the speeding bullet. If you have a Bible, quickly turn to Romans, Revelation 19. Now I'm going to warn you right up front. I don't know how many years ago it was I preached Revelation. It took me almost a year. It tore me up one side and down the other. <laughs> There's four basic versions of the interpretation of the book of Revelation. I think I took them all and made the greatest hits and it turned into five. It was like, oh my gosh. But don't lose the hope in Revelation because it's a book of encouragement more than anything else. It's not going to be an exhaustive study. Sit back and absorb, regardless of what your view of eschatology, which means end times, might be. Don't dot and tittle me here. Just listen, okay? When I read this, I was reminded that Jesus not, is not sitting back disinterested in the world events. He's not up there with a, uh, reading the paper and having a cup of coffee, waiting till 1 o'clock to watch the Browns. Each and every day passes, we are one day closer 
to the greatest event in modern history next to the world's spoken creation into existence by God. And that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. The problem is the newspapers, which I was once a part of, aren't going to be around to report the story. Because it's going to be a little too late. And it's a reminder to you and to me, when I'm stuck on the micro, don't forget the macro. Verse 7. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Historical presentation, imagery, reality. Receive it. There's a great ocean of praise shaking the heavens. Hallelujah. The Lord all God, the Almighty, the powerful God reigns. He's in control. The marriage is soon to be consummated at the great feast of the Lamb. Those who know the Lord, the bride, and the great groom, Jesus. You're going to have that eternal feast in glory forever as he now establishes his new kingdom and his new earth. Old Testament saints, past saints, tribulation saints, dead saints, living saints, we're going to be adorned in fine linen, bright and pure, which is the outward manifestation of works. Good works you've done for God because of the good work he's done in you. You will be rewarded, even beyond heaven. That's why I want to live my life right here. It does matter. Some people sit back and say, I'm going to heaven, I'll just wait. (laughs) Wait for what? Take your temperature. Is the spiritual blood flowing? We have a purpose here. Where do you think those linens come from? From people who have served the Lord painfully. Why do you think Paul writes, do not grow weary in doing good? You know why? Because we grow weary in doing good. He's getting it in perspective again. Yes, it's going to be costly. Yes, it's going to hurt. Yes, I'm going to get loose sleep. I got to call. I hope you guys weren't up. I got to call 3 a.m. New Year's Day for one of our young men who was stabbed. And I had to go down the metro. That wasn't how I planned my New Year's Day. I wasn't up partying. But God will interrupt your life often. And that's why I have to give it to him every day. I got to kind of, you know, I said, sorry, Lord. Somebody was at our house just the day before and said, yeah, sometimes as a pastor, you don't have your hours. They're not yours. I said, yeah, yeah. He didn't have to prove it. (laughs) But it happens. It happens. Tim Keller says, at the end of time, there will be the wedding feast to end all feasts. It celebrates at long last the intimate and permanent union of people who love each other. And this is how history ends. This is what Jesus came to accomplish. We, the bride, the people Jesus has loved, will finally be united to him. And the most rapturous love of a wedded couple on earth is just the dimmest hint and echo of the cosmic future reality. This is like big time. And that's why he says here, those who have been invited, have you been invited to the wedding feast? You need to ask that question of yourself. God has laid it out to you many times, multitude of times. I'm not necessarily even speaking to people right here, people that are listening out there. We've had great evidence from ministry we've had this week with people who don't even live in Cleveland that somehow got hooked into the YouTube. And they're asking questions, good questions, life questions. But all that end up with an invitation. Have you been invited to the wedding feast? Jesus is the Lamb of God, it says here in verse 7. What is the Lamb of God? The incarnate one. Gentle, 
humble, sweet, nurturing, compassion, shepherding, yet sacrificial, submissive. He's interceding for you and me right now at the right hand of the Father. That's one of those great questions I'll ask him. How are you praying for everybody at the same time? He'll probably say, because I'm God. All right. <laughs> I'll take that. But he goes on to say, to her has been granted to be clothed with fine line, bright and pure. And the angel said, write, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me stop right now. Are you blessed? If you are, tell them so right now. Tell them. That invitation didn't become because you decided to, you know, I'm going to see if I can crash this party. <laughs> hey, can you get me invited? Because God reached out to you first. And they often say, Lord, why me? I got most of my people as lost as lost can be. And I love them. And I pray to God one day, one day, that light bulb's going to come on. But why me? He said, well, I'm also going to hold you accountable for that joke. Not because I'm a pastor. Because I'm a follower. These are the true words of God. I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your comrades to hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy is a word we don't often use here. Jesus in his life answered over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament, fulfilled them. Peter Stoner is a, a physicist and an astronomer. He said if Jesus were to fulfill 48 prophecies, not 300, but just 48, it would be the equivalent of 1 or 10 to the 157th power. Put a name on that one. He said if you took one half dollar and painted it red in the state of Texas, two feet high of half dollars, and you blindfolded somebody and said, you got one hour to find that coin, that's what that would be equivalent of. And Jesus didn't answer 48 prophecies. He answered 300 prophecies. That's one of the proofs of his deity. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then what happens? Let your imagination go for a minute. So heaven opened up. There was a white horse, and it wasn't the Lone Ranger. It was the rider called Faithful and True. Words that describe the Godhead. Words that describe Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John 1, he is the living word of God. And he will judge fairly in righteousness. He makes war. His eyes are like a flaming fire, Hebrews 4.12, that penetrate our deepest bone and marrow. He knows my thoughts, my, my, what I'm dealing with inside. He knows it all. Don't hide, Joe. He knows anyway. Hebrews 4 and 12, he cuts to the core by the power of his word through his spirit. His eyes are like a flame of fire, brilliant holiness. And on his head are many crowns or diadems. He has a name inscribed that no one knows. There's a part of God that is so mystique and, and just mysterious and majestic that you'll never know. I'll never know. Because his ways are higher than my ways and yours. And his thoughts are higher than your thoughts and his. But what I need to know, he tells you, he tells me. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The blood that he shed to save his saints. His name is the word of God. And the armies of heaven wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Ephesians 6, the word of God is that sword. A sharp sword, which will strike down the nations, will rule them with a rod of iron, Psalm 2, and will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. Evil will pay in the end. 
That's why he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. On his robe and on his thigh, he's, his name is inscribed, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who will come to destroy Satan, sin, the Antichrist, and all who oppose him. He came as the lamb in all humiliation. But his second coming, he's coming to cleanse and to destroy and to bring victory one last time. Jesus Christ, the only righteous and loving judge. Tremble. Jesus Christ, the only sovereign ruler. Be confident in him. Jesus Christ, the perfect revelation of God. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. John 1, 1 to 3. And to quote Lucy in C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Down Treader, how, how can we live never meeting you? Have you met him? Not because of your family, not because of your upbringing, not because of your school, not because of your not school, not because of, you know, I'm my, my dad's a pastor or whatever. Have you met him? Yourself. Because you can meet him right now if you haven't. And that's why this book closes in Revelation. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. He's coming again. That's the macro. Think about that every day. And then go do that micro because we all need it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless your name and thank you for this day. It's hard to imagine. I was just trying all week to imagine what the thing is going to look like when the heavens open up and you come out riding a white horse and I was thinking, well, where is that going to happen? <laughs> is the whole world? Is it here in Cleveland? Where? I don't know. I don't even know. But I believe you. I believe you're coming to bring a dramatic ending to this world that we know. And the only fear it should cause within us is reverence to respond rightly to you in love and then carry forth this ministry of reconciliation to others. Lord, I pray that the spirit of encouragement would fall upon this church and every person in it, that you would stir us, Lord, that every time we said, I can't, you would show us how we can. God, that you would be glorified as we look to you for strength, as we exalt in your Godhead, and as we await the victory that has already been won and it will soon manifest itself to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.